So, um, yeah, so my name is Carl Meinhardt. I'm a professor at UCSB. Uh, today I want to talk about some transport processes in microfluidics and photonics. Shift it up a little bit. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of uh, UCSB. So you can study fluid mechanics here, even applied fluid mechanics. Uh, the surfing's good here at the uh, point. So uh, I welcome anyone to come visit. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, I want to talk about two things. Some is work at UCSB. I've been a professor there for the past 20 years. And uh, through research at UCSB, I've actually uh, got exposed to comms. So I'm an experimentalist by training. Uh, and so 16 years ago, I was talking to a colleague, uh, Professor Linda Petzold, in computer science. And I said, hey, I want to simulate this problem that we've been working on experimentally. And she said, oh, I have this brand new software called FemLab. And it's version 1.2. So here, try it out. See if, see if you can do it. And as an experimentalist, it's like, I don't know anything about numerical simulation. I tried it, and I could actually get results. So I was very uh, happy. And that's been 16 years ago. So I've been using it for, for a long time. Uh, uh, published a reasonable number of papers. Uh, and these papers, a lot of them have used COMSOL and experiments. And in my research group, we tried to combine the two. Uh, I want students to have some experience in the lab and some experience with COMSOL, and then use the simulations to match the experiments uh, and vice versa. And I think that's a, a, a very good way to train uh, future researchers. Uh, and uh, I'm also a fellow of the American Physical Society. About four years ago, we decided to found a numerical design. And the reason is that uh, companies would approach us and say, can you do this for products? And also, uh, Comsol was getting better and better and could solve real problems much more easily. Uh, and so it, it seemed like a, a natural thing to do. So we started this company a few years ago. Um, we do simulations as well as uh, microfluidics design, microfabrication, uh, things like that. So, uh, so it's been a lot of fun. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, particularly uh, former students uh, Brian Purick and Nick Judy, who are here today, and uh, current student Alex Eden, who also has a talk later today. And we've been funded by uh, DARPA and AIM Photonics. Uh, now, the research that I typically do uh, is in the length scale between 100 microns, so typically a human hair, and below that. So between a, the size of a human hair and, say, 100 nanometers, uh, a, a viral particle like HIV. So that's kind of the length scale that I want to talk about today. Uh, it's really the length scale that most MEMS works at, a little bit larger than the nanotechnology area. And to keep in mind, visible wavelength of light is about a half a micron. Um, OK, so as an academic, uh, we're allowed to ponder questions. We, we don't have to necessarily make money every day, like uh, the industry people, but uh, uh, we ponder questions. And so one question that uh, was pondered to me was, is it possible to convert light directly into acoustics? Can you make sound out of light? Um, you know, and so, so that's a question. It's like, how would you do that? How would you do it directly? You can do it indirectly. I could take this laser pointer and point it at a few people and might get some screams in the audience. But maybe there's a, f a more physical way to do it. Um, so one idea, if you look at it from a photon level, let's say you take a photon, an uh, infrared photon, say it's uh, oscillating at a couple hundred terahertz, uh, and uh, interact it with matter in some way that it creates a stoke-shifted photon that's at a lower energy level slightly less than 193 terahertz. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, with that excess energy, generate an acoustic phonon. Generate another, taking one quantum mechanical particle and photon and generating a second photon plus a phonon, uh, an acoustic wave. So can you do that? And so the idea would be the acoustic waves would be considerably lower, down around uh, 10 gigahertz. But that's still kind of high for an acoustic wave, right? I mean, we can audibly hear 20 kilohertz. So we're talking not megahertz, but gigahertz acoustic waves. OK, so, uh, so we can look at these things. We can look at them both with classical equations, Maxwell's equations, solid mechanics, as well as from a quantum mechanical effect, uh, photons and phonon interactions. Um, and so uh, in order, if you look at it from a quantum mechanical point of view, uh, phonons, we have to conserve energy. Uh, so we have a pump, pump photon at a certain frequency and a shift uh, photon at a slightly lower frequency, and then we had the, uh, the acoustic frequency. So those have to sum together for energy conservation. Momentum conservation specifies what the wave number has to be of the acoustics as well. So, okay, so we take in a photon, comes in this way, pumps the medium, and if we were to scatter a backwards photon, a Stokes photon backwards at a lower frequency, those would actually beat together. 
and you could be, and you'd see this uh, fringing field with these two photons beating. Um, now, what we could do, now the, okay, now the computer froze up. Okay, <laughs> okay, so if they beat back together, then they create a fringing field, right? And this fringing field, there's a property, all materials have this electrostriction property, where if you have an electric field squared, it'll produce a stress in the, in the material. So anytime you induce an electric field, you'll have an electrostriction effect. So that's the other thing. So these, these phonons don't last very long, but they last, they last a long time compared to the photon frequency, which is hundreds of terahertz. So, uh, but yeah, they don't last very long, but they can be there. Uh, and so they can exist. And if they, or if they did exist, um, you would have this electrostriction stress. This electrostriction stress based upon the, if you average the electric field over a, a period of, of the 100 terahertz, uh, this fringing field creates these compressible tension waves, oscillating tension compression in the solid material that, of course, lasts for you know, a long period of uh, 10 nanoseconds. But if it did, it would actually create an acoustic wave. And if this acoustic wave uh, repeatedly built up, you're also creating phonons very, very quickly as well. So you could actually theoretically keep, accumulate phonons. Okay. So, you had the, so maybe you could have this acoustic wave traveling um, through this material. Um, and what happens if you have an acoustic wave, that's a variation in stress, a variation in pressure. It's also a variation in density. The variation in density creates a variation in the index of refraction, which could create a moving three-dimensional grating, diffraction grating. Okay, so the acoustic wave, it's like a pockle cell. So the acoustic wave create a three-dimensional moving grating that could then reflect the light. So, so it's kind of a chicken and egg. You'd need the acoustics and, and this, um, this scattered light to create each other. So they have to exist simultaneously. You can't have the scattered light without the acoustic, you can't have the acoustics without the scattered light creating the acoustics. So, so it's a chicken and egg simultaneously just showing up. Um, so that was, that's the idea. Okay, now how feasible is it? Well, it turns out that it was theoretically predicted over 100 years ago, or nearly 100 years ago in the 1920s by this guy named Brilliant. Uh, and uh, it's a brilliant scattering is the idea. Now, it's, it was around in the 20s, but it wasn't observed. It actually was observed in the 60s when we had lasers and masers. Uh, it was actually first observed because you needed to get intense enough electric fields to get the, the electrostriction stresses high enough to create enough phonons and enough scattered photons because they kept dying off every 10 nanoseconds. So, so this, this the phenomenon occurs, but it just doesn't occur readily observable unless you have very, very intense light. So it's a highly nonlinear effect. It was observed in the 60s, and now it has a rebirth in the last five years. And the reason is that people have figured out a way to actually do this on a chip. So you can do it on a, on a photonic chip now in the last few years, uh, stimulated brilliant scattering. And so now it's taking on a new rebirth. So it's had a couple of rebirths. And so, so it's a pretty exciting field right now. So, how would you do it with photonics? So the idea is if you have a ring resonator, you have a waveguide coming in, uh, you can, this is a console model, it's available in wave optics, but you can build up very intense electric fields in this ring because they get constructive interference at the right frequencies. Okay, so, um, so the Hollis group at Caltech is, is one of the pioneers in this area, and they made optical rings, but rather than using guided waveguides for the ring, it's actually what's called whispering gallery modes. So the idea is that you'd have the photons going in through here, but they have internal reflection off of the boundary. So there's a boundary, so it's a whispering gallery mode. Uh, and so they actually make it out of, out of these uh, SiO2 wedges, silica wedges. Okay, and so how would you simulate this in COMSOL? Well, the, the way that we've come up with a simulator is actually using the axisymmetric geometry, uh, where this is on the order of, say, 10 microns in height, very small, but the ring diameter is uh, a few millimeters. So you bring this way out here in space and plot it there, and then using the axisymmetric equations, do a modal analysis, and you can actually pull out the mode. And because of the bend radius, uh, it actually pulls this mode out towards this edge. Okay, so you want to place it at the right position. And it's very important to design the optics and the acoustics simultaneously. And they did a great job of this. Um, and so you solve it with the modal analysis in, in COMSOL. Now, you can take, the nice thing about COMSOL is you do the multi-physics. So you solve the electro-optics in 2D, 
And then you can map that electric field into 3D to do the 3D acoustics. So you map that into 3D domain and do the acoustics. So keep in mind, you use frequency domain for this, right? So you're doing the optical modes at very high 100 terahertz frequencies. And then the acoustics, you slow it way down, map it, and do another frequency domain, but it's really slow. It's only 10 gigahertz. So, so very slow uh, acoustics compared to the optics, but still, of course, very fast. Uh, and then uh, you have a forcing term, which is the electrostriction stress tensor. And that comes out of the photoelasticity tensor. So, so you guys are familiar with photoelasticity uh, effects, putting stress changes the index refraction. So that couples directly into electrostriction. So we have a, a photoelastic tensor. And for silica, the oxide, uh, it's this cross term that's really important. So you have electric fields uh, in the z direction create uh, stresses in the y direction, so compressible stresses in the longitudinal direction. So we apply that to this three-dimensional acoustic field. It's what the, the, uh, the electrostriction stress looks like cutting through that. Uh, and then we calculate this mode overlap integral. So it's really the acoustics. In order to get the acoustics to stick around, it needs to have an acoustical mode and a, and a photon mode that overlap. So this uh, Reiki uh, came up with this integral a few years ago. And so you can actually calculate uh, the electrostriction force and the velocity distribution, look at the mode overlap, and then sweep omega and find out what frequencies the acoustics would actually live. And if you're off a little bit on the acoustics uh, frequency, there is no uh, mode overlap and no uh, combining. But when you carry through this integration and sweep this space, uh, you find very fine lines of, of gain. And they're very strong. There are orders and orders of magnitude. In fact, Vahala, uh, Caltech recently reported in Nature of Photonics that he is able to get Qs on the order of 800 million. That's a high Q factor, right? 800 million. Okay, and, he, and he's pushing the limit. He's trying to get to a billion. I mean, ambitious, right? But, but he's getting close. So this combining phonons and photons allow you to build very, very high Q resonators. Uh, and so, the, so when you have a very high Q resonator, it becomes very sensitive. Now when it's very sensitive, now you can use it to detect things that you couldn't detect before. So they're using it for all kinds of sensors. And, and so there's a whole, um, whole area, a whole field now that's working on this, uh, this type of brilliant scattering for sensing, with, using photonics and phonons. Okay, so I want to shift topics real quick and talk about an industrial example that we've been working on at Numerical Design. Uh, and this one is how to build the world's fastest valve. So switch gears, so no more phononics, photonics and phonons, but let's do mechanical things, fluidics, microfluidics. How would you build the fastest world va world's valve? What, how do you increase speed if you're trying to do a mechanical valve? Well, what's the first thing you would do? What's that? Make it light? Yeah, make it light, exactly. You want to decrease inertia, right? Make it light. One way to make it light is to make it small. Right? Make it small. You can use low density materials, but you can also make it small. And this, the field of microfluidics that's been uh, coming on strong for the last 20 years uh, focuses exactly on that. How do you make fluidic devices that are, say, 100 microns in size, channels that are the size of a human hair? And then what can you do with those things? Uh, and it turns out you can do things you couldn't do otherwise. So here's a, a picture coming out of uh, Matthew's group at, uh, at uh, Berkeley. And the idea here is that you build it out of PDMS. So PDMS is a, a very pliable material. If you apply a vacuum on top, this membrane comes up, allows the flow to go through. And so you can create these valves that are very small. And so this is actually a very good step. But the problem is that you can still only get them to be about 10, 20 hertz. Not very fast. So it's still got a lot of... Uh, 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 a lot of uh, room to grow. So maybe we could push the envelope. Maybe we could get faster than uh, a few hertz. Okay. And so this question was posed uh, by uh, IMT uh, in uh, Innovative Microtechnology, which is one of the top MEMS foundries in the US. It happens to be in Santa Barbara. And, uh, and basically, they had an idea a few years ago. And what they decided to do is, what if we use magnetics? So rather than using PDMS, which is a fairly viscous material, uh, a lot of losses. What if we use magnetics and we use silicon? Well, you say silicon doesn't bend very well. 
But actually it does. If you make silicon thin, like this is a, an S-spring, if you make it thin enough, it actually bends quite well. It, uh, you can get a lot of displacement with very little strain. And silicon is a very a high Q material, has very low viscous losses in the material itself. Uh, and so it's actually a pretty good material for, for uh, actuation. So they had this idea where they take a magnetic pole, a microfabricated magnetic lens that focuses magnetic fields down to a, a few microns. Keep in mind, this is uh, basically the size of a human hair, this cross section. Uh, and so you can, you can force the magnetic field, focus it down, and here's a magnetic actuator. You can pull on it and cause this thing to move. The, here's the armature, which could actually take flow coming in, and, and now it, normally it goes in and goes down the bottom, but maybe if you move this, you could get the flow to go out the exit. So that would be a valve, so you can just move it back and forth based upon magnetics. So that's the idea. So this is typically what the size would be. So it fits not in the palm of your hand, but in the, the tip of your fingernail, basically. So very, very small, sm about the size of a human hair. Now, if we wanted to simulate this with ComSol, what would we do? Well, the geometries are very complicated. So uh, you need a nice program like SolidWorks to draw the geometries uh, and then use the live link or something like that to bring it in. Um, this magnetics, it's all 3D magnetics, so you need a good magnetic solver, Maxwell solver. Fortunately, the ACDC module has that. 3D fluid structure interaction. This is inherently a 3D problem, and it's a structure and fluid and deformation. The solid is changing the domain, so you need to uh, map the, uh, the, the fluid domain. Uh, particle tracing, so you can track the Lagrangian trajectories of things in the flow. And so we put this thing together. It took us a couple months. And so when we solved it, typically these problems take a few days to solve one to four days. Uh, you solve it on a workstation, like 32 processor workstation can take several days to solve. It takes about 60 gigs of RAM. And because of the complicated geometry, this thing has to be remeshed. And Comsol has this re automatic remeshing uh, process that you can remesh it uh, in a matter of um, uh, many, many times. And so we remesh it commonly 60, 80 times per simulation. So it moves, warps the geom geometry changes, warps the mesh. Uh, so we have to redraw the geometry, remesh it, resolve it, restart it. So it's a very uh, involved process. So the first step, you have to do the magnetic fields. So the ACDC module, solve, uh, solve for the magnetic field equations. Um, very nonlinear materials, but fortunately there's libraries of these nonlinear materials in COMSOL. Uh, and getting this BH curve right is very hard, and solving it is even harder because it's very difficult to get these uh, solvers to converge when it's such a uh, stiff uh, curve like that. But, but it's, it's doable. And from that result, we get the magnetic fields. These, these are focused down. This length scale is a, a, about a, a quarter of a human hair. So, so a lot of stuff happening in a very small amount of space. But we can pretty accurately get this magnetic field if we know the BH curve properly. And then from that, uh, we get the magnetic field lines. Uh, integrate the Maxwell stress tensor and calculate the forces. So we know what the forces are on the actuators of function of distance. Okay? Uh, now, once you know the forces, then we can go do the fluid structure model. So you take the fluid structure model, solve the Navier Stokes equations, uh, solve the structural dynamics equations. It's a very dynamic problem, so you need to keep the inertial term. Even though it's small, inertia still matters. It's very important. Uh, and of course, it's a nonlinear uh, displacements, large displacement terms. Uh, and then, of course, the moving mesh, and this is all coupled together using a Winslow solver. So we, we solve all these equations simultaneously using a direct solver. Uh, we need a direct solver. The iterative solver, because it's so nonlinear, uh, is difficult. But with a fully coupled solver, we can get it. Typical mesh, about a, uh, not quite a million degrees of freedom on the mesh. And it's very important to get the mesh just right. So when we put it all together, this is what the, the simulation looks like. Magnetic valve is actuated. This thing pulls up. You can see the flow comes in, moves around, and it exits out. The flow, the flow now, it's completely open. They release the magnet, and then the spring from the silicon pulls it back into, into position. So now, when we first started this, the flows didn't look like this. There's a lot of extra vortices. There's a lot of issues. So we were able to change the shape. You, you may say, well, that's a weird looking shape. But it turns out that that was after many iterations. We changed the shape and modified it to get the kind of flow that we wanted. And also to optimize the speed of it opening and closing. 
and to balance the spring forces such that it opened and closed at about the same rate. So there's all this engineering that went into it that could only be done with console. These valves, uh, to make them, takes a long time to make it through the foundry process, and it's very expensive. Each fab run is, is, is quite expensive, and it's a lot of lead time. So trying many, many things and iterating takes a long time. But if you can design it on the computer and iterate the many designs on the computer, identify the four or five that you like the most, lay those out on the mask, build them, and try them, it really improves the design cycle. Furthermore, because this is so small, this is smaller than a human hair, these speeds are like a meter a second going through this thing. Um, it's very hard to experimentally measure. So you couldn't design it based upon experimental measurements either. So the only way you can really visualize what's going on is through numerical simulation. So that's, um, so COMSOL is just an in, invaluable tool for, for this process. And you notice it, it opens in about 12 microseconds. So we can go in, we can actually identify the details of this, what exactly is going on, okay, during the opening, starting to open. Now it's open, and there's the maximum velocity is actually during the opening, which is probably, say, five meters a second, very high speed. Um, uh, and then uh, after it closes, after it's fully open, uh, you, you get the flow sorting going through there. So that's what the valve looks like. So, so it's really cool. So you build these, these nice, neat things, very, very small things that were unimaginable 10, 20 years ago. But then what can you do with it? So you, now you have the world's fastest valve and maybe the world's smallest valve, but what good is it, right? You can't turn your shower on with it, right? So, so what would you do? Well, it turns out that Owl Biomedical um, basically made a cell sorter out of it. So if you have cells in your body, like cancer cells, and you want to identify the cancer cells, you can put fluorescent tags on it, have the cells flow through, and then I pick out the one, million, one in a million cells and sort that out. Now, because it's really fast, it's, uh, you know, it's on the order of 12 microseconds to open it, they can actually sort 55,000 cells in a second. 55,000 cells in one second. Now, think about that. That's 200 cells an hour, two, or 200 million cells an hour, and that's almost a billion cells before lunchtime. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a lot. And this thing can go for billions of cycles because the silicon doesn't, uh, it doesn't degrade. So it's, so it's actually a, a quite a remarkable valve. And uh, so let, let's play a quick video. I have a, I have a propaganda video for you. So, you know, uh. The Max Quant Taito is the world's first high-speed closed system cell sorter. Taito employs a unique closed and disposable cartridge system that utilizes a patented microchip containing the world's fastest valve, capable of safely sorting up to 200 million cells per hour. Cells flow rapidly through the chip where they're interrogated by three lasers. The fluorescent and scattered light signatures are used to determine which cells are to be sorted. To sort, a powerful magnetic field is applied that opens the microchip valve, redirecting the desired cells into a closed sort collection chamber. The Taito sorts these cells with high fidelity, high speed, and high viability. The MaxQuant Taito offers a rapid and efficient way to sort living cells that is easy to use, aerosol-free, promises to revolutionize cell sorting for medical researchers in life science research and cell therapy. So yeah, so these things are real products. They, they just started delivering these things about uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, with that, uh, um, I'd like to just wrap up numerical design. So we have expertise in microfluidics, biomems, uh, electromagnetics, photonics, plasmonics, uh, a variety of sensor capabilities, fluid structure interaction, uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, chemical reaction engineering, and uh, acoustics. So uh, please visit our booth, and if that, I'd be happy to answer any questions.